Today's video is sponsored by Mine, the smart data assistant. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. For tens of thousands of years, money, in one form or another, has been making the world go round, enabling neighbouring communities to trade with one another, giving individuals an entirely new way of gathering wealth, and facilitating the expansion of countless empires throughout history. Nobody knows exactly when money first came onto the scene, because its origin predates written history. For a long time, anthropologists assumed money was invented as a replacement for bartering, but it turns out that in the entire history of our species, there is no hard evidence whatsoever for the existence of a society that relied on barter as the only means of exchanging goods. And that actually makes a lot of sense, because when you think about it, bartering is a terrible way of doing business. For a successful barter to take place, you're going to have to rely on what economists call a double coincidence of wants. Or in normal person words, not only does the individual you're trying to barter with need to have whatever item it is you want, you also need to have whatever item it is that they want. It's no surprise then, our ancient ancestors needed a better way of doing business. It may be that the use of money first arose as a way for ancient humans to deal with times when food was scarce. For example, when prey species migrated or forageable foods were out of season. Money allowed neighbouring tribes who may have specialised in hunting different species to trade with one another when times were tough, helping both parties thrive. Of course, the kind of money we're talking about here didn't much resemble what your local ATM might spit out today. Long before we had the technology to mint coins, commodity money was the only show in town. Currency has changed a lot throughout history. And do you know what the most valuable currency is today? It's your data. That's right. Companies that you may have only used once, a few years back, are getting rich from the data you gave them for free. That's why recently I've been using Mine, a personal data service that helps you to discover and track your digital footprint and also helps you to remove your personal data from platforms and services that you no longer use or no longer want to be affiliated with. This minimizes your digital risks and online exposure to avoid future data breaches before they happen. So let's have a look at all the companies that have my data according to mine. Whoa, 1,327 companies have my data apparently. I've been a busy boy. So let's see who's got my info. Hmm. I don't use Outbrain anymore, and I don't want them to have my data. Let's take a closer look at what data they have of mine. So they have my financial data, as well as my email address. I'm going to reclaim that. With mine, you can automatically send a data deletion request to the company from your inbox. Let's go ahead with that. And there we go. It's as simple as that. The security of your personal data is really important. After using mine, I'm confident that I have better control of my data than ever before. And I want you to have that feeling too. So be sure to visit saymine.com today. The link's in the description below to find out where all of your data is and how to reclaim it. And mine is still free to use for now. Soon, it'll be a subscription service. So be sure to get your foot in the door today. Commodity money can be made up of any high demand item that has intrinsic value of some kind. Things like peppercorns, tea, shells, and silk have all been used as a form of commodity money in the past. In Italy, Parmesan cheese has been used as a collateral for bank loans. And for a period in medieval England, 40 sticks of eels could pay your rent for a year. Prisons have long been something of a breeding ground for new kinds of commodity money, because inmates in most countries aren't allowed to possess cash. Cigarettes are the classic example. 
But more recently, ramen noodles have become increasingly popular, as has drug-free urine. I should stress, these kinds of commodity money really are only usable in prisons. I tried paying for my Sunday morning paper with a litre of high-quality drug-free urine just the other day, and the lady behind the counter called the police. Arguably one of the most bizarre currencies of all time are the rye stones, found on the Yap Islands in Micronesia. These stone coins are circular in shape with a hole cut through the middle, which may not sound too dissimilar to those lovely shiny discs you find down the back of your settee, but rye stones have one significant difference. They're absolutely bloody massive. The biggest measure up to 4 meters in height and weigh 4,000 kilograms. That's about as much as your average male Asian elephant, and even the smallest are around 30 centimeters across. These coins were so large, it wasn't uncommon for them to capsize the boats used to transport them, and once back on land, it could take upwards of 100 men to deliver them to their intended destination. According to local folklore, the stones were first created as a result of an economic trade between two sets of islanders. The story goes that 500 years ago, a Yapese navigator called Anagamang led a small group of men on an expedition to the neighbouring island of Palau, around 200 miles away. When they arrived, they were in awe of Palau's abundance of calcite a type of limestone which glistens in the sun. This sparkly stone enchanted the Yapis with its magical aura. And so, an agreement was made with the Palauans that the people of Yap could help themselves to as much limestone as they wanted, in return for certain goods and services. Anagamang ordered his men to carve the limestone into the shape of fish and crescent moons. But he soon realised circles were far more convenient when it came to transporting the large pieces of rock. The hole in the centre was added so that the stone could be slipped onto a log of some kind, making transportation easier still. To begin with, rye stones were little more than giant souvenirs to show off to the people back home. But soon, the stones evolved into a new and exciting kind of currency that could be used during important social transactions, like marriages and political deals, or even to purchase food. You might be wondering how exactly the Yappies made this system work, considering the somewhat inconvenient, near immovable weight of their pocket change. Did every Yappies own a house-sized piggy bank and horse-drawn wallet? I wish the answer was yes, but the Yappies came up with a far simpler solution. Once a rye stone reached its destination, it stayed there forever. Even if a trade was made and ownership of a stone changed, the stone itself would remain exactly where it had been placed after arriving on the island. This even extended to those stones which had capsized boats and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. The submerged stones didn't lose their value and could still be traded by word of mouth. Of course, a great deal of honesty was required in order for the system to function smoothly. Transactions of unseen rye stones would only take place if the islander in question was considered a well-respected member of the community, and if the oral history of the particular stone was well established. After all, it wouldn't have been hard for some bright spark to start bragging about his incredible wealth in rye stones that had all been conveniently lost at sea. The value of each rye stone wasn't just determined by its size. Many other factors were taken into consideration, including how difficult it had been to obtain the rock used to make the stone. The quality of the carving was also key, as was the reputation of its craftsmen. Finally, a stone's worth could be affected by the transaction it was being used for, meaning it could be worth one thing for a wedding and another for an inheritance. 
When Irish-American sailor David O'Keefe arrived at the Yap Islands in 1871, he was immediately enchanted by what he saw, and in particular, the rye stones. In fact, he was so fond of the Yap Islands that he cleared his busy schedule and stayed there for the next 30 years. O'Keefe saw an opportunity where others had just seen ridiculously large stone coins. He swaggered into town like a rye stone cowboy. I'm so sorry. And unlike Westerners before him, he embraced island culture. He even introduced the Yappies to more advanced tools, which made the process of creating rye stones easier than ever before. O'Keefe set himself up as a trader and soon established a reputation that became known halfway across the Pacific. He went on to acquire his own private tropical island, where he lived with multiple Yappies wives. Something he presumably didn't mention to his wife back home in America, who was still waiting patiently for him to return. As it happened, O'Keefe never made it back home. His journey from Yap ended in tragedy when his ship was wrecked in a typhoon and he was never seen again. His 30 year stay on the island irrevocably changed Yap, and his presence there is still remembered by the islanders today. But in spite of O'Keefe's good intentions, the tools he introduced ultimately ended up having a damaging effect on the Yappies' economy. Seeing as a stone's worth was largely dependent on how difficult it had been to obtain, the new stones didn't carry anywhere near the same value as the old blood, sweat and tear stones that had been mined in the years before O'Keefe's arrival. Somewhat ironically, the giant currency of Yap began to experience inflation. But not even a rapid reduction in purchasing power could knock the world's largest currency out of its stride. In fact, remarkably enough, rye stones are used as currency by the Yappies for certain special transactions to this day, though regular money is used for everyday purchases. It's pretty incredible that such an unusual, not to mention impractical, approach to money has somehow stood the test of time, when literally thousands of other historical currencies have fallen by the wayside. But then again, maybe we shouldn't underestimate the ingenuity of rye stones. I mean, the concepts they're based on are actually surprisingly advanced. In fact, when you think about it, Rye stones have a lot more in common with Bitcoin than they do with the loose change in your pocket. I know, I know, that sounds mental, but hear me out. Both Bitcoin and Rye stones rely on a ledger system to ensure the transparency and security of transactions. With Bitcoin, this ledger is known as the blockchain, a secure public record of each and every transaction that has ever been made. Rye stones use a very similar system, though this time through word of mouth. A ceremonial gathering takes place whenever ownership of a stone changes hands, where island chiefs announce the transaction to their subjects, preventing stones from being wrongfully traded. With both rye stones and bitcoins, all of this happens without the use of a centralized banking system, which other forms of currency are dependent on, giving the people the power to maintain the economy. We think of these as very contemporary ideas, but the Yappies were using them half a millennium ago. We even talk about people mining for bitcoins, just as the Yappies mined for calcite on the island of Palau, 500 years ago. You know what? Screw Dogecoin. I'm off to huddle some rye stone. Thanks for watching.